Welcome to the Timberlake Christian School podcast. Timberlake Christian School, founded in 1966, is a ministry of Timberlake Baptist Church. Our vision is to be a discipleship and educational institution for young people in order to develop them in a passion for glorifying God and train them for a life consistent with a biblical world and life view. For more information, check out our website at timberlakechristianschool.org. Go Tornadoes! Hi, good morning everyone. On this nice and drizzly day. So we have one of our first panels for this year and looking forward to to this time. It's also a time where you get a chance to hopefully ask questions and be involved in the process and then follow up even later in our peer-to-peer groups with discussions. So we have four guests today and, and looking forward to, to hearing them, or well, three guests and then uh, Jacob Ryan as well. So I'm going to open a word of prayer uh, and commit this time to the Lord and then turn this over to our team up here as well. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful Help us, Lord, to be grateful people. It is so easy to look at what we don't have or look at what we want and be disgruntled, and yet we've got so much to be grateful for. So I pray for this day. I thank you for for our time, for the men who've committed their time to this discussion, and just understand, Lord, the how we could depend on your word and even what we see around us as you reveal yourself through creation. What a wonderful and great and mighty God we serve. And Lord, help all that we learn here to strengthen our faith, that uh, we might be encouraged, and uh, just commit this to you, Lord. Thank you for all the work that goes into it. Thank you for our time this morning in prayer, for those who were able to make it a little bit early and spend our time in praying for the school, praying for this nation, praying for those who are being persecuted for the gospel. So we thank you for the blessed time we had this morning already in prayer. And we commit this rest of this morning to you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to introduce our, our lead panel guest for today, and that's Dr. Marcus Ross. Who was here last year for the middle school event, the Middle School Apologetics Boot Camp? So Dr. Ross spoke there. He's awesome. If you're there, you already know that. He is a trained paleontologist and geologist and also a Bible-believing Christian, and that's a rare combination sometimes in the world. And he also accepts a literal reading of, of Genesis there, being a six-day creation account. So here in chapel... For the past little bit, we've been talking about the creation account. We talked about why we should take it as literal history. We've walked through some implications of accepting it that way. And so now today, we're kind of taking a different side of that for more of a scientific angle, but also looking at the text. And hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions there. So without further ado, Dr. Ross. All right. Well, good morning. It is good to be here. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation uh, to come back to Timberlake Christian School and speak with you guys. Uh, how many of you, again, were here last year for uh, the middle school event? Cool. It is nice to see you guys again. We had a lot of fun uh, with that event last year. So we're going to start off our panel here with a, um, a short look at the text of Genesis. I'm actually going to move a little bit out of the way because we'll have a slide come up, not right now, but in in a little bit. Uh, Just one slide to get us anchored here. From what I've been told, you guys have been looking at the text of Genesis and specifically Genesis 1 through 3. And uh, they even shared with uh, me some of the worksheets and whatnot that you guys have had, so I know a little bit about what you've been doing. Might have a little bit of a pop quiz here. But don't get too stressed out. My talk here, this brief talk, is called Hidden in Plain Sight, helping us to see more in Genesis 1 through 3. So one of the things I was asked is to start off with a bit of a question. How many of you heard, have heard um, that maybe somebody has said, well, Genesis 1 is, you know, it's just poetry. How many of you have heard somebody say something like that? Genesis 1 you know, is poetry. Well, if you haven't heard that, that's actually a very common um, argument or claim about Genesis chapter 1. It's not very common in, say, conservative evangelical circles, but I grew up in Rhode Island. Most of my friends uh, went to Catholic school, or went to Catholic mass, um, and a lot of them were told that Genesis 1 is basically poetry. 
It's a mysterious document that we shouldn't take literally. So, okay, that's one, one possible way to look at it, but is it the best way? The thinking is that Genesis is kind of poetic because it has a, a rhythm and a structure to it. And again, it seems to be this kind of mysterious text to some, so why not poetry? Well, there actually is rhythm to Genesis chapter 1. There is an overall kind of structure to it beyond just God telling us what he made on which days. There's that component, but there's something bigger going on with Genesis as well. <clears throat> but let's look at the poetry issue here. The usual pattern for something in Genesis 1 is like this. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and the evening and the morning were the what day? Anybody remember which day I'm reading from? All right, I'm seeing, yeah, second day. There was evening, there was morning, the second day. God separates the waters below from the waters above, creates an expanse, and he calls it heaven. So, can you hear how these verses move us through events in time? Right? And God said, let there be an expanse. And God made the expanse. And he separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. Uh, in the Hebrew construction, that's actually called a vav consecutive. I don't actually read Hebrew, but my sister... Dr. Jillian Ross teaches Hebrew over at Liberty University, and so she teaches her students about this. But that use of the words like and, and so, and then, and but that, that are used in our English translations are helping us feel that we are moving through time. That's exactly what the Hebrew is trying to get us to know here. So the things are happening one after another. This is how a narrative works. A narrative is a story that moves us through time. There's lots of different kinds of narratives. There are historical narratives where we follow actual people in actual events. And then there are things like parables, where Jesus tells us a story where we're following a character through a series of events that may or may not be historically true, but it's telling us a story. Either case, we're moving through time, and that's what Genesis 1 is doing here. Now let's hear a poem from Genesis 1. There actually is poetry right there in that chapter. It's found on the sixth day of creation, in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Do you hear how that sounds and flows differently from the previous verses? Right? In these verses here, the story doesn't move forward. It pauses so that we can reflect on something that's important. There's repetition for our reflection. The first two lines say basically the same thing, and then the third line modifies it again. Listen to it again. In fact, close your eyes. Yeah, actually, yeah, close your eyes. Let's listen. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right? Those lines don't move us through the story. They keep us inside a moment. This is what Hebrew poetry actually looks and sounds like. It's not about rhyming or meter, right? Roses are red and violets are blue. I'm not good at rhyming, so this one stinks. Wait, right, no, that's, that's a bad rhyme. That, that's a terrible bit of English poetry. We're supposed to have rhyme and meter. But the Hebrew poetry doesn't work that way. They do different stuff. They work by balancing ideas, by repetition, by compare and contrast. So this one verse right here, verse 27, is actually poetry in Genesis 1, but it's the only bit of poetry in all of Genesis 1. The rest of it is this narrative that moves us through time. So it's interesting because not only does Genesis 1 do this, where we have a little bit of poetry inside the narrative, Genesis 2 does this as well, and Genesis 3. All of them are narratives that have an ending poem. Hmm. So in each case, the poetry is actually used to highlight something that is tremendously important to what you've just read in the narrative. So in the narrative, we're following God through his creation, 
And then we have this little poem, and the poem is actually trying to carry the big theological punch here. And the big theological punch, the one thing that you need to remember above all else in Genesis 1, in this poem, is God made humans in his own image. That is the take home for Genesis 1, or at least one of the main ones. It's, it's hidden in plain sight. We don't notice it as much because we're English readers and writers and hearers, not Hebrew ones. We're outside of the way that they usually do things. So we have to kind of learn this stuff again. But it's hidden there. It's camouflaged. But I did say that Genesis 1 has rhythm and structure, and yet it's not poetry. So what do we have here? Well, here's our quick little pop quiz. If you've been reading, I, I know you've all been reading Genesis 1 through 3, so let's see what you remember. We'll start with an easy one. What was made on the first day of creation? Somebody, go ahead, put up your hand. Light and dark. Boldly stated, I like it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light. And then he separated the light from the darkness. All right, someone else. What was created on day four? The fourth day. Someone... Pop up a hand. Yes. Yep. Yes, man. Excellent. God created the sun and the moon and the stars. Somebody else remember, God didn't use the word sun, though. What did he call the sun? What's that? The greater light, right? And the moon was called the lesser light. But he created the sun and the moon, although he doesn't use their names. That's kind of weird. But he created light. Wait a second. Light was created on the first day, but now he creates things to bear the light on the fourth day. That's intriguing. And there's a separation between light and dark on the first day, and then these heavenly bodies are there to rule over the light and dark, to separate lightness from dark. Huh. Okay. What was made on the third day? Somebody else. What was made on the third day? Yes. Plants were made on the third day. Great. What was another thing that was accomplished on the third day? God separated two things on the third day. Oh, there we go. Yes. The land and the sea. Excellent. So sea and land are separated. The plants are made on the, on the third day. So that brings us then to another question. What was made on the sixth day? Yes. All right. Great, so we've got the creeping things and the cattle and the beasts of the earth and Adam and Eve. Excellent. Okay. All of those things, where do they live? On the land, which was made on day three. And Adam and Eve, whose names we're going to get later, but the people that God made and all the animals, what were they commanded to eat on the sixth day? What were they told they could eat? Plants, plants that were made on the third day. Can I get that slide um, put up? It was a PDF? Oh, it is there. Great. Outstanding. So here we've got some of the interesting structure that we have on Genesis chapter 1. If we take the days and don't just write them straight down, but actually arrange them in a little bit, we start to see some patterns. God creates the heaven and the earth and light and dark on the first day, and on the fourth day, we have the heavenly bodies, and their job is to rule over the day and the night and to bear the light and separate the darkness. There's comparison. There's parallel here. And as we just saw, God created land and seas and plants, and on the sixth day, he creates animals to live on the land and humans to live on the land, and he gives them plants to eat. On the second day, God separates the waters and puts an expanse between them. So we have a, a sky or an atmosphere or heavens. We've got water below. And on the fifth day, he fills that sky or that expanse, and he fills the waters below with things. Days one and four and two and five and three and six mirror each other in certain ways. Hmm. Now, this arrangement is not complete and perfect because... For example, God calls the seas, seas on day three, and on day five, he says, let the waters, the seas, teem with the living creatures. And God 
makes um, other sorts of stuff, right? He creates the, uh, this stuff over here on day four. They're going to be bearing light. There's, there's some things that don't quite match up. And what that tells me is that this system of kind of the first three days in which God is sort of forming space and dividing things, and the second three days in which God is filling in that space, that structure is there to help us understand what's going on, but it's not artificial. If it was artificial, everything would be completely perfect. But remember the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the second verse says, and the earth was what? Formless and void, right? Or unfilled and unformed, or formless and empty. The first three days are basically about God forming the stuff of the earth, and the second three days are about God filling it. He says it was without form and empty, but by the end of the creation week, it is formed and it is filled. Hmm. There's some other things going on here that are really interesting. Um, and I'm going to have to skip through because we've got our panel to get to here quick. There's so much in this text. It's, it's honestly almost like crazy, crazy filled with things. On each day of creation, God looks at what he did, and then what does he say? Everybody together. And it was good. good. And God says that every day, right? Nope. Yeah, I know. I just you're like, uh, what am I going to do? He says it almost every day. And in fact, he says it enough that it could have been every day, but he didn't say it every day. In fact, we read the one day that he didn't say it, and that was the second day. God separated the waters above from the waters below, and in the, ex in the expanse he separated. He called that heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. There's no point in the second day where God sees what he did and calls it good. But he does it on the other days. Why? I didn't see that before. It was, it's an interesting little point that's camouflaged. And this is where you have to get your Bible out and you have to start circling good. And if you do that, you'll find that God says it was good on the first day. He skips the second. He says it twice on the third day. That's because what he separated here, he finally completes what's going on on the, second, on the third day. He separates the waters, but he doesn't call the waters seas until the third day. Then he creates the plants. He calls them good, too. Hmm. He says it's good on the fourth day. He says it's good on the fifth day. And then we get to the sixth day. God says that it was good. And then he says that it was? Oh, come on. He says that it was? Very good. Very good. So he says good two times here, just like he said good two times here. But this one is the encapsulating very good. So we get six times where God says it was good. It, skip. It was good. 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 It was very good. Wait, that gets us to the number seven, which is kind of an important number for God. It's an important number right here. We have seven days of creation. Oh, and God doesn't say that it was good on the seventh day. Instead, he rests. He also doesn't say there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. That one's missing on that one. And you're like, like, was it not a day? Does that day like continue on forever or something? Like, no. But it almost becomes poetry again over here because God wants you to linger on the fact that he rested and made the Sabbath holy because he's preparing the Israelites to go into the land and telling them that on the seventh, uh, on the seventh day of your week, you're going to rest and you are going to enjoy my holy day. So there's all kinds of theology that's packed in here. And I mean, I wish I had time for more, because we haven't even touched or uncovered the camouflage message about how God establishes his superiority over time and space on the first day. Uh, we haven't found the hidden picture of how God insults pagan gods on the fourth day. That's pretty wild. We haven't even been able to spot the hidden message about naming things and how we become part of the image of God when we do that. Now, these aren't secret Bible codes, okay? This isn't some sweaty guy in a basement on YouTube telling you about weird things hidden in the Bible. Don't watch those videos. Okay, that guy's strange. He's weird. He's going to make you believe odd things. This is not that sort of secret information that the church doesn't know about. The church has known about this. 
because they paid attention to the text, because your pastors read in the text, they read from people who know and are knowledgeable. These are the deeper meanings. They're subtle, but they are hidden in just plain sight. All we have to do is figure out a little bit about the ancient world, about the writer, about God's intentions, and about kind of seeing this inside the regular scenery. It's like one of those pictures that's in the picture. And if we can do that, we can glean extra insights into the marvelous meanings that we have in Genesis 1. And we haven't even touched on 2 and 3 yet, but we will in a little bit. So I will wrap up here. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll start our panel. All right, everybody. Hey, let's focus in. We don't have but so much time, and we're going to use it wisely. Let me say something to you real quick. Hey, everybody, look at me. Look at me. A lot of times... I have noticed that these random sound and AV and all these issues tend to happen more when we're talking about an important topic. Now, I don't say that to mean any sort of thing other than just a simple observation. And so if anything, I think this should reinforce for us that what we're talking about today is really helpful for you. And we've got some gentlemen here who can be incredibly, I think, advantageous to you spiritually and for the rest of your life in understanding these things. So we're having this panel, right, and we're talking about creation, we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about Genesis 1 and why we should understand it in a certain way, okay? That's why we're here, and that's part of a month emphasis that we're doing in chapel on this idea of the creation account of why we should take what the Bible says here literally and why we're arguing, again, we've already talked about, Dr. Ross has already talked about, why we can't take this um, and try to merge it with modern evolutionary thought. So in his introduction, Dr. Ross walked through for us kind of why, even though there, are, there is poetry in Genesis 1, there is a, a kind of uh, understanding of a structure of it, all these things, but that doesn't mean it's not a narrative that we're supposed to understand historically. Does that make sense? It's, it's real history is what he was pointing out to us just by the very nature of the text itself. Um, and, and so from that, just to kind of push that in, Mr. Hill, if you just want to start us off here, what's the big deal with any of this anyway? So just from your take as a science teacher here, as a believer, why, why should we care so much about talking about not accepting evolution? Can't we just merge those things together? What are your thoughts on that? So before I do that, I have to say one thing just to make sure we're all clear. The word evolution can sometimes be a trippy word because it can mean different things for different people. And so, to be fair, there's two types of evolution. So there's one type of evolution, which is the theory that we're kind of talking about today, which is what we call macroevolution. Macroevolution states that there are small changes over time. I'm telling you, it only happens on important topics. There you go. Small changes over time, and those small changes then change. So you've got one species or one type of creature, and you end up getting a totally different one later. So that's like Tyrannosaurus rex, common ancestor from that, leading to chickens and birds. Okay? Two totally different species. In that case, actually, two totally different phyla, but that's a different point. There's also microevolution. Microevolution is the idea that you get a creature and there's small changes within that creature, but it's still that type or kind of creature. An example of that, um, specifically around here, the peaks of otter, we've got salamanders. During one of my labs when I was at Liberty, um, we specifically looked at a type of salamander called the peaks of otter salamander. And it is a salamander that looks very similar to a red back salamander. Difference is it doesn't have a red back, it's got a blue back but they're both salamanders. Yeah. So there's just a different phenotype or the way that you see it. So now that I've explained that, and I'll make this answer very brief, the idea of different creatures having down the line new different kinds totally contradicts what we see in the Bible. The Bible says that God made them each according to their own kind to reproduce after their own kind. It doesn't say that he made them to reproduce to make different kinds. Again, multiple chickens, you have lots of chickens, but they're all chickens. You've got multiple types of cow, but they're all cattle, right? We don't have a cow changing to a horse. Yeah. Why don't we, uh, let's turn yours off and we'll, we'll switch between, Mr. Hill, if you turn yours off, and then just kind of branching off of that, 
So we have, I didn't introduce him yet, you guys already know him from last year, but this is Michael Duncan here. He's the youth director at our church at Timberlake Baptist. And um, I asked him to come here because he's answered some of these questions for his youth ministry, um, specifically thinking about how it interacts with other areas of theology. Um, so is that one not working either? It needs new batteries. Okay, well, we'll just split between the two we have and we'll be all right. Um, I'm telling you. But anyway, uh, Michael, tell us a little bit. So if, if you accept evolution, Mr. Hill's already pointed out that Scripture doesn't, it just doesn't align with Scripture first off. But how might accepting that theory, proposed by Charles Darwin there in the 19th century, how does accepting that theory or even parts of that theory affect other areas of theology? Maybe define theology for us first and then talk about other areas of Christian thought that taking in that, that belief will affect. Sure, yeah. So yeah, it does certainly affect other areas of your belief. Theology is, is simply just what we understand about God and, and, our, and our own faith and all, all of the matters that encompass that. So it can certainly affect that, and we could spend a whole chapel message on this alone, uh, so without doing that. Uh, a couple of things came to mind. Uh, first is the authority and sufficiency of the Bible. I think that problem might be the most prominent thing that I thought of. Yeah. Namely, is the Bible telling you the truth? Uh, can you trust just the plain words of the Bible? If there are untruths somewhere in the Bible, then who's to say there's not more in other places uh, in the Bible? If the Scripture is giving you an untruth, or an incomplete truth, I would say too, for that matter, in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, then where else is God not telling us the truth? Because this, this is kind of talking about who God is. Is God telling us the truth? Because this is His Scripture. It's what He gave us. Uh, if that's your position, if the Bible is filled with untruths or incomplete truths, then it's incumbent upon you to decide where the other untruths are. And your only measuring stick is yourself. That's the only measuring stick you have if that's your position. Your own subjective thoughts on matters. And if you're, you're a professing Christian, I would submit to you that's a really unhealthy place to be as a professing Christian. So that's a, that's a massive issue that, uh, that you have to think about. Also is our doctrine of sin, like what we understand about sin, our homardiology, specifically about death and where that came from. The scripture is pretty clear. The wages of sin is death. That's the punishment for sin. If you ascribe to macro evolution, like what Mr. Hill defined for us, if you ascribe to that, then you have to believe that death preceded sin in some capacity. I mean, when millions of years pass, something died, didn't it? I mean, things didn't live for millions of years. Something had to, had to die. So when did man, first of all, get to the point of becoming man? So the image of God comes into question too. But when did man actually get to the point of being able to sin consciously against a holy God? When did Genesis 2.17 actually apply? If you eat of the tree, then surely you'll die. I mean, that's a specific command targeting a specific sin to a specific person with a specific punishment. When did that take effect? Um, death is the punishment for sin in Scripture. And so if you have... may have to pass this one. We'll be okay. Yep. So if you have death before sin, you really have a serious homardiological conundrum that I would submit to you can't really be rectified in the Bible. You have to play a lot of scriptural gymnastics is what I would, is what I would say to do that. So this can affect your view of the Bible, your view of God, your view of yourself, your view of sin, and all those beliefs will affect the way you live your life. Your beliefs affect your behavior. Your patterns of life come from your patterns of thinking and your beliefs. So it affects a lot of things. If I can say one thing real quick, just to piggyback off of what he said, for those that may not have studied macroevolution in general, the whole reason we get changes in species is survival of the fittest and there's other things like that that are putting pressure that the ones with the better adaptations survive. But by default, if they have to survive, that means what is happening that other ones have to die. And that's the issue that we're discussing here. Just wanted to point that out. And I guess I'll follow up. As a paleontologist, I study very dead biology. Right? I study stuff so dead it doesn't smell bad anymore. That's, that's a big plus compared to the biology labs. Um, but yeah, the, we have a fossil record, which is the record of dead stuff. So the question regarding death and its origin uh, is an important one. Uh, and, and the argument here is, 
did all that dead stuff happen over hundreds of millions of years of Earth history, um, or is that dead stuff a product of, um, of, say, something like Noah's flood and a post-fall situation? So those are the, the sorts of questions that we have to uh, come to grips with when we start asking questions about how do we entertain the science and Bible, and as Christians, looking to see a unified picture, right? Because we believe you know, the Lord our God is one. We know that the Lord is truth. He is life and light, uh, and he doesn't lie. And because of that, we can look at what he has written, and we can look at what we have in the world around us and recognize the unity between uh, the revelation that has been given specifically through his word and the revelation that exists around us through his creation. Yeah. Is this one? Can you turn on the Cajon mic for me, Cody? Yes. Hello. You got me? Maybe? I'll take this one. All right. Um, let's follow up on that for you, Dr. Ross. Um, I just, so we're talking about the theory of evolution, and quite often, especially, you know, we're kind of in a bubble here at TCS sometimes, right? So kind of two layers here. First off, it's kind of assumed a lot of times that we take a six-day literal approach to, to creation, right? Just because it's kind of where we are. Um, and so sometimes we even see that as out there, but when we get into the world, especially maybe even some of you guys who are seniors, you're heading off to college soon, all that kind of good stuff, it's going to be presented quite often as though the theory of evolution were just, you know, solid scientific fact, this is just the way it is. You know, you might have your book that says something different, but really you just need to get over it, right? What would you say that? Is it established scientific fact? It, maybe tackle that, and then I know you have a couple of brief words to say about perhaps how we interact with those when they come to us that way. So you, can you maybe touch on that for us? Sure. So um, my educational experience was K through PhD, completely through state schools. I went to public school. Uh, then I went to Penn State for my undergraduate. I went to a school out in South Dakota that was a state school for my master's degree. Then I came back to my home state of Rhode Island and went to a public school there. It wasn't until I started teaching at Liberty University that I actually found myself at a Christian school where you could stand up and actually pray in front of people. I thought that was weird. Like, I, it wasn't even a math test, and they let us pray. Um, it, public school, they'll even give you a minute for that. Yeah. Um, so when I went to all of these schools, and especially once I got to college, uh, evolution was simply presented as fact. Old Earth geology and uh, Big Bang cosmology was simply presented as fact. It is nearly universally believed amongst um, scientists out there. And so I found myself very quickly in a minority position, uh, which I already had been in, in high school, but we didn't talk about it that much. But in college, I, I was usually like one of the few people who thought the way that I did. So yeah, we are in a bit of a bubble here where you get to hear more than one side. You know, that, I think that's one of the neat things about being in a, a setting like TCS is that you're going to hear about creation, but you're also going to hear a bit about evolution. And if you're going to go out into uh, the world, especially to study some of these things, if you're interested in science or even if you're interested in theology, you're going to come across these things. Uh, one of the approaches that I took was to become as good of an evolutionist as I possibly could. I didn't have the luxury of pursuing creationist research as a science student because none of my professors thought it was legitimate. So that meant that I had to study evolution and know everything that they wanted to teach me and answer all the questions like they wanted that done. Um, and so it, it was an interesting situation, but what it did is it helped me to think in two worlds and to wrestle and contemplate about what are the strengths and the weaknesses of both and finding out that a bunch of things that I thought in creation turned out to be not correct, but also that a bunch of things that were being presented as evolution, though there were really good counter arguments that nobody was listening to in that. And, and so that brings me then to then how do, you, how do you interact with your professors or your fellow students who think differently about these things? And you have to remember first off that you are to be a shining beacon of the light of Christ wherever you go. If you call upon the name of Jesus, that means that you are to bring his light. And you are to remember that every person that you meet, evolutionist, creationist, Christian, Buddhist, agnostic, whatever, is a person who's made in the image of God. And therefore, is someone for whom Christ died because Christ loved them. And so I don't look at evolutionists as a them and a they and a those people. I don't look at them as an enemy group that needs to be defeated. Evolution as uh, the, the big scale evolution, I think is an incorrect scientific theory that needs to be overturned. But the individuals who hold to it are people 
to whom I must show love and care. It doesn't mean that I always end up agreeing. It doesn't mean that sometimes there aren't arguments. But in the end, those arguments have to be set aside so that I can say, but Jesus loves you. And so evolutionists were my friends. They were my roommates. They were my office mates. They were my co-authors. They were my advisors. They were everybody around me. And that means that I've got to you know, not be at odds and be a jerk around everybody. And in our society right now, it's easy to be a jerk. It's really easy. Just go on Facebook. Right? Well, try not to, right? And you guys are like, Facebook, that's mom's thing. Like, okay. But anyway, right? Online discussions just make people angry. So don't be angry. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get to some questions from you guys before we go further. What, do we have any questions? Anybody have any hands up? Anything you'd like to ask? Anybody at all? Yes, Melody. Um, I think in the second verse of Genesis, it says the earth is formless and void, and the earth is void. Yeah. That means the deeper verse was like nothing, or does it refer to water? And if so, would the water be the same? Great question. Who wants to tackle that one? Yep. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the Hebrew word that we translate as the deep is techom. And you've got to say it like Jewish, techom. Um, and it means water. It, it, it means the watery surface of like the ocean or any sort of big sea. Uh, the Mediterranean would have been a techom. So it's a, it's a term referring to deep water. And so when God first creates the world, we can think of it as kind of like this watery mass. It's almost like a ball of clay that God is going to form, but it's not clay, it's water. Now there's, there's earth underneath that. So um, the water doesn't exist before God. God doesn't kind of approach the creation and like now I'm gonna make it, but it's already out there. But rather, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's kind of like God's initial creation. And then it says, now the earth was formless and void. It's so like, oh, okay, so when God created the heavens and the earth, the first state that it was in was this watery, chaotic ball. And now God is going to form and fill that over the days. So the first verse of the Bible is starting us in the first day, and then God approaches what he has just made as this formless thing, and now he's going to continue on and build that so that at the end of it, nothing is formless and nothing is void. Yeah. Cool question. Very good. All right, what other questions do we have, anybody? Hands up. We got one here from the front. Go for it, Jen. Woo. Your hair's up. It's freaking me out. I can't tell from this angle. You're in the kind of the dark. So, uh, Cambri uh, Cambrian, uh, Cambrian explosion is like one of the hypotheses that closest to a uh, creationist. And how can we prove that uh, Cambrian explosion is like the one of the thing that exists there? Okay. So, last question was about. Man, this is really. Yeah. So the Cambrian explosion is a term that refers to the sudden appearance of a wide variety of different animal groups, what we call phyla, right? those big, huge divisions. Like vertebrates are part of a phylum, but insects are part of a totally different phylum. So we can think of those as like the big categories. Cambrian is uh, a unit of rocks. Uh, geologists think from the bottom up. We think like low down, old, and up top is young, kind of like a big, messy desk, like mine. Um, and Cambrian are the groups of rocks where we first see lots of different types of uh, ocean invertebrate creatures. They all kind of show up very quickly. And it, evolutionists think that something radical must have happened in order to allow life to very quickly evolve into these different animal phyla. But we don't have any evidence of the evolution in the rocks below this. They just kind of all pop up and they're there. So uh, for young earth creationists, I think that the Cambrian explosion is probably evidence of the first waves of Noah's flood that are destroying ecosystems in the world. For people who think that the earth is ancient, but they don't believe in evolution, what we would call an old earth creationist, many of them think that the Cambrian explosion is evidence of God creating a whole group of organisms 500 plus million years ago. So what we have are data. We have rocks, without fossils, and then we have a bunch of rocks above them that have a wide variety of fossils, and we've got kind of three different interpretations. Rapid evolution, 
sudden creation or sudden destruction during the flood. And uh, our job is to try and figure out which one of those makes the most sense. From my standpoint as a young earth creationist, I think that God has already created the world. The fossils are dead things, so they're things that happen after sin has started. And Noah's flood provides us with the best mechanism to start that fossilization and preservation of lots of animals that die during the flood. So three different ways to look at the Cambrian explosion. Cool question. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, pass this on to you. Well, I think what he was pointing out is the evidence is we see the fossils in the Cambrian explosion. The question is, how do you interpret that, right? And so based off of your worldview, right, you guys, worldview and from my class presuppositions that you're holding to, naturally we will look at our worldview and we will interpret in a way that makes sense to our worldview. If I believe the earth is young, as he just mentioned, with the flood, because I believe that the flood was real, that fits my worldview. If I believe that the earth is super, super old and there wasn't a flood, right, it makes more sense to think it came through. So the data in, in that case, or, or what we see as evidence, everyone sees the same evidence. It's how you interpret that evidence. And that, that's what makes it, in this case, difficult. There's no one there, so we don't have any eyewitness accounts, and we don't have anything specifically except that data. Let's, I know we haven't had time for as questions as we want, but we have one more question, anybody. Lydia over here, what you got, ma'am? Okay, so in Genesis, it says that the earth was without form and void. But when I think of void, I think of nothing. So what is void referring to? You want to quickly... Uh, yeah, great question. So the word void there, um, we tend to think in terms of like absolute nothingness right? We think totally empty. And, and that's because of our own language. Uh, and for the Hebrew, um, the, the words here, formless and void, it's a fun little thing called tohu va bohu. So it kind of rhymes as you say it. It's only ever used in a couple of like, they're only used together in one other place in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is talking about the destruction that's coming from uh, the Babylonians. And it's going to be so complete that he's going to look out and the world is going to be tohu vabohu. It's going to be formless and empty. Well, it's not completely empty. Like, there's still trees out there and grass and there's wild animals. But he's like, but there's nothing, basically, out there. Uh, deserts are referred to as void. So void in the Hebrew concept is something like there's things, it's there, but it's not productive. There's nothing useful to us out there. So in the beginning, when God creates the world, it's that watery chaos ball that is unfit for our productivity. But by the end of the creation days, now that world has been formed and it's been filled and now it can be productive. We can be there to be the image of God to the rest of the world. Yeah, that's good. All right, so we're gonna do one more question kind of to wrap up, combine several questions at once here. So we had some submitted questions from you guys that we didn't get to. One of them was specifically talking about the idea of if you have another Christian who says your specific view of creation doesn't really matter. I think that's a big theme with a lot of us in this, this discussion is, well, does this really matter that much, right? Why, why are we even having this, this panel? Why are we pushing through all of these tech issues to try to still get you what we're talking about? Like, why, why didn't we stop when the keyboard started playing a beat in the middle of the song, okay? Why? Why is this worth our time? Um, and, and so sometimes we think, especially as Christians, well, I've, I've got Jesus, I know what the gospel is. Does this really matter pertaining to that? Um, and so I'm hoping in an answer to that question, Michael, you might be able to touch a little bit on specifically this guy named Adam and why he might matter and maybe what the Apostle Paul might have written about him in Romans 5. It'd be great to close with that scripture just to kind of to end us on that, if you don't mind. Let me get to Romans 5. I was planning to go to this passage anyway, yes. Yeah. So Romans 5, the question of Adam and gospel issues and everything like that, um, really good. Uh, so I do believe that Adam, you know, have, is of course a real person, uh, in part because we know Jesus Christ is a real person. And these, these, two, these two figures are more, I guess, interrelated than we sometimes realize. And a prominent passage we see that is in Romans chapter 5. There's several verses here. Romans 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, 
and death through sin. In the same way, death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the same way as Adam. He is a prototype of the coming one. Verse 15, but the gift is not like the trespass, for if by one man's trespass the many died, how much more has the grace of God and the gift overflowed to the many by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ? Verse 18, so then as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, just so also through one righteous act there is life-giving justification for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Did you see the pattern there? Did you listen to that pattern? One man sent humanity, us included, into the oblivion of sin, and then another man, another legit real man, digs us out of it. One man's disobedience leads to guilt for all of us and death as a result. And then the one man's righteousness, the Son of God, led to justification as a result, life for those who turn to him in faith and repentance. You inherit Adam's guilt, but through Christ, we get his righteousness if we turn to him in faith. So if Adam wasn't a real dude who committed a real sin at a real point in time, and then the ramifications of that undone by another real dude, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who did not commit sin, then why do we need passages like this? Why, why do we need Jesus? Why could we not just self-atone for our own wrongdoing? Why do we need Jesus at all? So this, this can affect our view of Jesus if we don't come down the right place on this. Now, I think another part of the question was, what's, why does it matter? You know, what does this have to do with the gospel? Um, why, you know, is this a gospel issue? You know, why can't we just focus on gospel issues? And I think that, that terminology um, has been used frankly, to beat people into submission, into believing and doing what we want or what, you know, some teacher wants. I would just say this to you if you're kind of struggling with that, you know, does this matter? Is this a gospel issue? Uh, Before you even start thinking about gospel issues and determining what gospel issues are, you need to know what the gospel itself is. I mean, if I were to ask you or Mr. Hunter were to ask you one day, just, just, just privately, not in front of everybody, just like in maybe two minutes or even one minute, could, could you just tell us what the gospel is? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel maybe you profess to believe. Could you do that? Could you tell us what the gospel is? Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, stepping down from his glory, leaving his, leaving his glory on the shelf, so to speak, to become like us, filthy sinners who inherit this guilt from another real guy named Adam. We are guilty just like he is. He takes our sin onto himself and atones for it on the cross, and you get his righteousness. Could, could you articulate something like that to us? So before we even begin to start thinking about gospel issues, you need to be standing firm on the gospel itself. And I'll say this too. Take it from me, uh, who is without a doubt the dumbest person on this panel, I, f- I feel like I don't belong up here with these mega minds. I'm learning just like you guys are. Um, but just take this as maybe just a closing thought. Um, you will never go wrong standing on the plain words of the Bible. You'll never go wrong. Some of you might be sitting here like, oh man, this. Some of you might be thinking, oh, this, this just goes way over my head. I don't have all this worked out. So I, I must be believing wrong if I don't have all of these questions answered or worked out. Guess what? I don't either. <laughs> Mr. Hill was telling me about light speed the other day, and I'm sitting there like with a blank stare on my face. You will never go wrong. You'll never lose your, your stead if you stand on the words of Scripture. You can rest in what God's Word says. So, yeah. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out here. Let me just, just close with this, okay? Everybody, look at me. I know you're thinking about other things. Look at me. I know there's been a lot of distractions today. I know there's been a lot of tech issues, all these things. But everybody, look. The main reason we're doing this is because we want you to know, number one, every line of Scripture matters. And in this particular issue, there are 
Bible-believing Christians who would disagree with us on an interpretation of a six-day creation. They're, they're out there. But what we're trying to show you is that in not taking Genesis 1 as real history, what it is, there are some, some implications of that thought. And some of those things that can lead from it, we're saying touch Christ itself. It touches the gospel itself, the way that we're saved through what Jesus has done in dying and rising again. So that's the main thought we want to leave you with, that this, this issue really does matter, and it's worth your time to think it over, okay? Let me pray. These guys will be around for a minute. Would love for you to come up, ask any other questions you have. I'm sure you might have more, and uh, then we'll close out, okay? Lord God, I, I thank you that you are in control. You are sovereign God, ruler of the universe. You're kind and loving and gracious. Lord, you give us this time, even now, with these guests to discuss your word, to think it through. Lord, these are real issues that these students will, will uh, see throughout their lives. They need to understand where we came from, Lord. God, that you made this world good without sin, without death. Lord, even very good. And God, we messed it up. We sinned against you. We deserve your wrath. And yet, Lord, you're so kind that you sent Jesus to live the perfect life we could never live, to die a sacrificial death in our place and rise again, so that by simply trusting in him, we can find life and forgiveness. Lord, thank you for that wonderful good news, and thank you for your inerrant, inspired, authoritative word, which we can stand firm on. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much.